security problems. My job here is to present some ideas to hopefully get you to think differently because the shit we're doing now don't work, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you've seen this before, haven't you? You've seen this bitch. All right. Your job is to beat the living shit out of me. And that means if I say something that's wrong, correct it. Correct me. It doesn't mean because I'm up here I'm right. It means I got some ideas and I got a loud voice. Oh, I should turn this on, right? Yeah. For the audio dudes. Any day now. What? Any day now. Digital. All right. Cool. So I, I turn that down a little, please. I'm going to get louder. Uh, uh, this is sort of uh, the premise of where I'm going. Uh, and been thinking on this. The premise of this was started on the Indian Ocean 19 years ago. Got serious about it two years ago and trying to finish up. Crash commercial plug, obviously. A book is coming out of it. All the swag out there, take it, have fun, beer koozies and what have you. End of pitch. The world as it is. Shit sucks. It's not working. <laughs> Things are broken. We all know exactly what the problems are. And we also know that the next great piece of technology coming up from Semantic is going to solve everything. Show of hands. <laughs> we know that the next generation firewall is better than the last generation firewall. It's going to fix everything. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got yeah. one guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, two people are full of shit. The existence of firewall is the admission that it's all shit anyway. So we're going to... Uh, Look at my growing up. I used to be a TV repairman, and we actually did fix TV. You could go down to the drugstore and replace all the tubes and actually fix stuff when you were five and six years old. Uh, I was, I'm colorblind, which made, uh, there was a talk by the lady earlier about diversity and such. I was discriminated against because I was colorblind. Couldn't go to work for AT&T. Couldn't go to work for IBM because those were part of the criteria. But what this did is gave me a basis for looking at the world a lot different than in the past. I grew up in the rock and roll industry, and it was purely analog. It was audio, and I had a chance to work with some great people over the years. Uh, over here, I built my first analog computer. I guess I was eight or nine years old, and then my father introduced me to diodes. He said, so here's how you can make gates using diodes. And so I had this early analog digital. Uh, kind of upbringing, which was very, very useful and took me 50-some years to make it apparent. So analog, what the fuck is analog? Anybody know what this is? Gear. Where is the gear? Show me the gear, dude. Not, not gear. Uh, Wrong word, not gear. What? Infinitely variable. Continuously variable trans transmission. This is the kind of stuff that we're seeing in hybrids, and it's an analog device. We don't have the strict gears going in four, five, or six binary positions. One of the things I want you to start thinking about as you move on in your career and after this, and if this is not too full of shit for you, is what really is analog? Um, is uh, her hair brown? Is that an analog question that deserves an analog answer? Or is it a binary question that deserves a binary answer? Uh, movies are movies. Analog or digital? Sir. Sir. All right, never mind you. Analog or digital? Movies. Come on. Did everybody know what a movie is? We'll start there. Digital? Digital. Why? Because that's what I've been told. That's what you were told. What is your name, sir? What is it? What, Eddie? It's made up of, well, new, newer ones, digital ones, are made up of pixels, but the old ones are still made up of individual molecules of different colors. Individual molecules? Let, let's, get, let's work on what, what does a movie really consist of? Frames. frames. Individual frames. Each is in, whether you're 24 frames a second, 29.97, whatever the format you're living in, those are individual frames. We perceive them as analog because this is an averaging machine. That's all that it is. And because of the repetition rate and the flicker, when you see stuff that goes slow, you're seeing the digital representation of the raw material inside of the movie. In the audio world that I grew up in, we had sine waves. And then we have square waves. Question, is there such a thing as a square wave? No. Why not? You'll have on or off. There's no, you'll have the illusion of the so does a square wave actually exist? Yes. 
No, so no, your transistor, transistorized circuits still have a microsecond delay. In You've got rough curves. You have rough approximations. And again, it's about approximation from when you look at a square wave, there is a rise time, and that rise time is how long it takes to go from nominally zero voltage to whatever five volt system you may be in, but it's still a rise time because there is no such thing as instantaneity outside of the quantum world. So when people start talking digital and you start thinking a little quantum, your view suddenly changes very, very quickly. One of the things that I found as I've been playing with analog and digital networking is that there is a duality. You don't have to look at the world of networks and security as only digital or only analog. What I am asking folks to do is to give it both views. Both are valid. Depends what you're trying to do. And it ends up that we're looking at really spectrums. Autistic spectrum, for example. Uh, are you a one or are you a zero? How far on that spectrum are you? Colorblind, how far am I on that spectrum? Pure black and white, full four rods, because there's a lot, there's a whole new generation of people coming along with four rod sensors in their eyes that see colors we cannot even possibly imagine. But it's all about a continual spectrum. And one of the things that we've been trying to do in information security for the last, and I've been at this 35 years, is look for binary answers. The new firewall, strong passwords, all of the bullshit that we've been hearing and putting forth, yes, they're individually valuable, but each one of them that we've been do doing thus far has been with a pure digital viewpoint. Either it works or it doesn't work. It's broken, it's not broken. Password is good or it's bad. It's cracked or it's not. And I'm saying we need to look at things very, very differently than we have in the past. I also have a thing called synesthesia. When I hear music, that's what I see, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Without drugs, I can actually do this. <laughs> so when I was in the music business, it was very, very easy to be able to talk to a piano player. Well, that was a blue note, that was a red note, but if you combine the two, I'm gonna see a green note. And I could see the colors in my mind, even though I could not see them in real life, which was something that we still cannot fully explain how I was able to do. But it gave me the ability to transform and think in more than one type of mindset. Is the internet analog or digital? Digital. One. Bunch of zeros and ones I'm hearing over here. That's as I turn digital. Internet as a whole is analog, but it's why is it at, why is the internet as a whole analog? It's constantly changing. It's constantly yeah. changing, continuously variable. And the other thing to keep in mind when you're looking at whether it's the internet or anything else is the issue of scale. Think about scale. When I'm looking at this picture, it looks really kind of analogish, and that's all sort of cool. But when you start taking a deep dive in, your granularity changes, the view of the granularity, the perception of the granularity changes, and at some point, you're gonna have more value of your answers and analysis by looking at it in a digital standpoint than purely in an analog standpoint. The brain is an averaging machine, that's all that it is. We do computation really poorly, but we can pick up a huge amount of data synthesize it into something that we believe is meaningful. And we're not gonna get into the whole consciousness discussion from earlier, but there's an awful lot of interesting things going on inside the brain right now, and none of them are specifically digital. We are human creatures that happen to be analog, and now we're trying to tie all this shit together. How do you get digital systems and analog systems to talk to each other? We did it in the audio industry in the 1970s through analog, digital, digital analog converters that had certain levels of resolution. 8-bit video game systems, remember them? Yep. Now we've got, what, 64-bit, you can't see, and you can't tell if it's real or not real in some cases, because the granularity is so high. What we perceived on those early Atari games, strictly digital, is now perceived by us as being an analog representation 
just like we do with conventional movies, television, and certainly in real life. So there is the fundamental difference is that analog is continuously variable and the binary conditions fundamentally do not exist. What mathematical system represents that? Anybody know? We're going to get geeky on you. This is the easy part. What mathematical system represents what I just discussed? Continuously variable with no zeros and ones. Elevators run on it. Fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic uses everything that's greater than zero and less than one. Elevators sometimes work on it, sometimes doesn't function all that well. But again, we have the synthesis occurring. And we're, it's occurring without any real forethought as to how it's going to affect security. And that's how I started looking at it from way back in the early days of the security. And I'm going to give you a little history on it. Information security was developed initially primarily by the Department of Defense. And in 1973, they came up with a system that says, we're going to keep the bad guys out of our computers. In my mind, that's a very binary function. Gonna keep them out. Now, how's that been working for 35 years? <laughs> the military called it fortress mentality. Now, the Maginot Line after World War I was a big, giant wall to keep the Germans out of France. How'd that work? Berlin Wall. How'd that work? Great Wall of China. How did the Mongolian crazies and Kublai Khans and all that, how did they bypass? Bribery. Social engineering was the tool used thousands of years ago to bypass a 1,500-mile impenetrable wall, unless you're David Copperfield. Who the hell knows how he does that? <laughs> this was the fundamental model that the, what we are still doing today in information security is based upon fortress mentality. It's based upon it at various levels in the stack. I don't mean only the OSI stack, but when we're looking at internet working, intranetworking, computer communications, all the way down to code level of libraries. The fundamental problem is, the, is exactly the same. It's a matter of granularity. So we look at it as a risk avoidance. And we've heard this term for how many years in our field now? We want to avoid all risk. How's that working for us? Not going to do very well, is it? Now I'm going to put up a quote, and I want to want you to read it. I think this is the only slide I'm going to ask you to actually spend a couple of minutes and read. So this sounds kind of like what we're dealing with today, doesn't it? Anybody disagree with this statement? As long as it implies people are part of the system. When was this written? What? 50 years. 50 years? Well, you got gray hair, dude. That's really unfair. <laughs> <laughs> this was written by Anderson in 1972, wow. which developed the fundamental first set of formalized, mathematically provable systems that existed. And it was called the reference monitor. And it's based on I don't, the Bell Lapodular work later, the Bibby models that came after it are still, which were done between 73 and 76, were based upon Anderson's primary work. And it fundamentally says, I'm going to have a system request, stop the process, look up ACTs. I use ACTs as a general rule. It could be any sort of rule set that you choose. Deny permit based upon the matrix, have a go, no go response, and either move on or stop the process. When this was designed, we had slow, slow, single processor devices, asynchronous communications between the user and the CPU, 
single hunk of wire connecting a green screen with 80 by 25 and one set of controls sitting in that box over in that room behind the glass walls. In that environment, with the capabilities of the day, this worked very, very well. Anybody familiar with RACF, ACF2, other than the guy with the gray hair? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is how fundamental mainframe single processor security systems were done and to a certain extent are still done on some IBM systems today. They still use a RACF derivative <coughs> using this kind of process at super, super high speeds. The problem with it is what happens when I now introduce synchronous communications to that process? What happens to my network, to my code? What happens? Gets out of sync. Not doesn't get out of sync. <coughs> what happens to my performance? It slows down. Slows down by how much? A lot. That's a good technical word. Thank you, sir. A whole shitload is probably a more accurate. Te it doesn't work. When you open Word, how many files open? Yeah, again, a whole shitload, right? Whatever the number is. And you got all this crap going on back and forth all the time. How can you have an ACT based reference monitor module actually work? you're not going to get performance. And that was the primary way that things have been done for the last 45 years or so. So a number of years ago, I wrote a simple book called Time-Based Security, saying, ah, there's something else going on here. Let's take a look at it and examine it. So here, uh, here's a vault. Uh, that, uh, it's six <coughs> feet thick everywhere. There's no electronics on it. Uh, the metal is made from the alien metal from Area 51, so you can <laughs> drill through it. Unobtainium? Uh, unobtainium? Oh, you know unobtainium. We got, we got a lot of that. When the door is closed and the lock is closed, latch, are the contents of that vault secure? You'd hope so. You'd hope so. That's kind of what we're doing today with our networks of data, right? We hope so. Are the contents secure? It depends on the attacker. Depends upon the, what does it depend upon, sir? Whether or not the attacker was already in the vault, for example. Or whether or not there is no air feed into my vault. <laughs> no breathing allowed in my vault. From an outside guy going inside, other than bribery, purely a technical attack, are the contents secure? Who said yes? Who said yes? Somebody had the balls to say it. What about a cutting torch? In the physical world, we have metrics. We know how long it takes, at what temperature it is, to burn through the unobtainium or the steel or the whatever, whatever. How many guys have gun safes here? Of course, we're in the South. Hey. Hey, I know. All right, we'll do Second Amendment arguments later. It's cool. That was yesterday. <laughs> that was hard. I missed that one. But when you bought your safes, there's a number that says, is it good for a fire up to this temperature for some, some, some given period of time? Then you're going to have a data breach. Your guns are gone. Your gold coins are gone, whatever it is. In the physical world, we can do this. Can we do this in our world yet? No. <clears throat> well, I'm going to show you a few things, hopefully. It's all about looking at the world time. How secure is this firewall? <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. That's another one of those technical terms, sir. Thank you for that. It gets first. On a scale of 0 to 10, how secure is that firewall? 17. 17. What? No one's going through that door. That's exactly what I did when I, this was a, I took this up in York, outside of London. And I went up there and I said, I wonder if I can get through there. And it took me the longest damn time. <laughs> this is often what our networks are looking like today. Because ultimately we just don't know. But what we find is, okay, in the, in the case of this jewelry store, there, there's a bunch of money in there and there's a big, thick pane of glass there. Are the contents in here secure? No. No, why not? Because given enough time, you can break through that. Given enough time, how am I going to break through the glass? 
Big Rock. <laughs> big Rock. Who said Big Rock? <laughs> Everybody gets right answers. Come get swag. If you didn't get right answers, take swag anyway. It's cool. <laughs> How many of you have ever gotten a written guarantee of the security of a firewall from Checkpoint? <laughs> How many of you have gotten a written warranty on how long the protective quality of your defensive technology is? Pick one. And how long? Any vendor ever guaranteeing their security? Not if they're smart. <laughs> Are you still buying it, sir? Absolutely not. All right, I like those answers. We are going to have an argument later, aren't we? <laughs> what I am maintaining is we cannot rely upon protection. Right now, this entire industry, spending $3 trillion in the last 35 years since I've been involved in this, things have only gotten worse because we have never really decided to look at the question, does protection work and do anything other than line the pockets of vendors and shareholders because there's always a way around it, whether it's my firewall. Anybody know the percentage of attacks for APTs that begin with social engineering? Oh, probably 80. <laughs> it's greater than 90% by most studies right now that they begin with some level of social <coughs> engineering attack, which means they're ignoring the protection mechanisms the protective controls that we spend all of this money on, they're ignoring them entirely. So in my way of thinking, when you have zero days, partners, unknown connections, everything that's wrong with our networks today, how do we, with any good consciousness, say that our networks are reasonably secure from a data breach? <coughs> how do we assign a risk level in a meaningful way to something where we cannot rely on nor can we measure protection. That's why we have marketing departments. <laughs> um, does that mean you're not going to buy my upcoming book? <laughs> so I'm going to argue that we cannot measure protection unless anybody else wants to argue with me on that. Anybody think we can measure protection? You can't, like, I can't know how long this chair will last, but I know that I built 10 million chairs and they last for X amount of time. So you, point, you're talking a physical MTBF, <laughs> yeah, physical basis exactly. of mean time between failure. That's in the physical world, it's explicitly measurable. Exactly. Right. In our world, how do you tell the difference between a misconfiguration, there are, there are an attack. There are a number of routers or whatever, firewalls that you're raging against. There are a number of them deployed. You can tell how many of them were hacked during what window, and then you say, we During what window of, of time. Time, thank you. Thank you. So it's a, we're back to time. Sure. Let me continue are on we this. quantifying the stupidity of users, too? Um, I'm not going to go into the human stupidity factor in this talk, but I'm sure we can engage in that a little bit later. But let's ask ourselves a question. In our existing networks, what can we explicitly measure? We can measure two things. Everybody's got an IDS, an a AV, all the technologies that are sitting there looking at for the bad signatures, bad packets, yada, 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 yada. We also know how to create test beds for bad packets. In any of your organizations, have any of you ever measured how well your IDS or IPS actually works as a function of time? <coughs> how long does it take your IDS, IPS, bad packet picker-upper, whatever the technology is, how long does it take to actually identify with some level of confidence, we'll get into that fuzzy analog thing a little bit more, that it's a bad packet? Do we know? We could know if there were tools and the vendors would really, really encourage us to have tools to allow us to measure their devices. So how many of your vendor, IDS vendors, give you the tools to measure the speed and efficacy of their system? Number two, reaction. An alert goes off. Pick the alert, I don't care. What happens? After the detection of the bad guy thing, the bad packet, whatever, 
you got to have a reaction, otherwise it's just sitting there and you end up with a stack of logs of paper, which are pretty damn useless. Loud noises. Sorry? Loud noises. Loud noises, that's it. And reaction means I'm going to notify the admin. Am I notifying them by SMS? Am I doing it by email? Oh, he's out to lunch. Oh, I'm going to, oh, now I got the feedback from him and I better call Mary because Bob's not here. Oh shit, it's six o'clock on a Friday. Uh, maybe we'll get to it on Monday. Ultimately, you're talking about them listening for the detection and reacting to it. In the ideal world, you're absolutely correct because that is going to, I'm going to show you how this works. In the real world, does it really work? No. Do no. people really do this? No, because you're not guys playing EverQuest. There are. There are. <laughs> <laughs> whatever they're doing, I'm good with whatever they're doing, and I get it. And these two components, detection and reaction, have, are exactly the mechanism that saved the planet during the Cold War. We would be able to detect a nuclear launch in a matter of, we'll say, milliseconds. Give it a couple seconds, whatever it is. We then had 18 and a half minutes to respond, to decide whether we were going to blow up the rest of the world too. The entire detection reaction component in the nuclear age of mutual assured destruction was based upon those two numbers, detection and reaction, because there was zero protection. Everybody with me on this? There was zero protection. It was either we respond or we don't respond based upon hopefully an accurate detection of what the Soviets were going to do. We don't have to do this now, we got other problems. But this gives us the basis for looking at something, the beginning of the analog concept. We can measure detection time. We can measure reaction time. But we don't know what our protection value is one measure at a time. The gentleman over here was bringing up the concept of time in the agglomeration. Absolutely correct. And he can average it over MTBF so we can look at statistics and come up with some sort of averages. However, that is what the IDS, IPS, big data people are trying to do now. And how is that working for us? It sucks. Awesome. You know, is that a technical term, sir? It sucks. Absolutely. <laughs> Ask Experian and T-Mobile. Uh, but that's another discussion I have on T-Mobile. <laughs> so, the very simple premise of PDR, and this came out of some early work from DISA from 1990 to 1993, was the concept of PDR. And the formula says something very simple, and I did not invent this formula, a buddy of mine named Bob Ayers did from, the, from DOD. He said, let's say I know my detection time. I also know my reaction time. That gives me exposure time. Very simple concept. That's my exposure, especially since I do not know how well my protective technology is working. However, if I could measure the efficacy of a firewall in the time domain, the efficacy of password protection, in the time domain. If I could do that, look at what happens here. If the amount of time that my protective technology provides me is measurably greater than the amount of time it takes to detect and react to a given security event, I have created a mathematically provable secure environment. It's an analog function. The amount of time it takes to detect and react will define whether I'm in a secure environment or not if I have the ability to measure my protective time technology, which currently, unfortunately, we, we don't. Now, we've got a lot of examples of this. Okay, nuclear compliance, we get that. Uh, we're a robbery at Walmart. Somebody sees a robbery, calls 911, cops come. Are the cops going to beat the guys out? Well, if they're smart, they're going to go in and do what we call it, a smash and grab. Go in, get your $50, $500 worth of stuff, run like hell, and you're gone inside of the known time window. When we see bad guy shows, there's always one guy watching a clock, 60, 50, 
measuring the amount of time because they have done, if they're good crooks, they have done their homework and know how long the best case, or from their perception, worst case response time is from the responding authorities, typically police or rent a cops or what have you. Uh, automatic cars, we've got all those going on. Are they going to be safe or not? They're going to depend upon two things. There is no protection in autonomous cars, is there? Protection is measured exclusively by the ability to detect stuff going on around you and reacting to it quickly enough. Everybody following this? Because we're going to start getting complex in a little while. Everybody got where we're going? I, I understand your premise, but um, isn't protection usually based on detection? I Give mean, me one example where a protective device is measurable. It's the only thing I'm asking. Well, so like, I'm, I'm thinking like an IPS, right? Okay. So like, I have to, do, to prevent, I have to detect. Yes. Right? And so my prevention... Well, now you're preventing, not protecting. Well, I'm doing both. I have to detect. Are you? Are, but are, in the case of an IPS, are you detecting and reacting before the bad act or after it? After an IPS, I'm, I'm protecting right then. Dropping the wait a minute, wait, you, right then? I mean, instantaneously, the word that I already said we can't use? There is no instantaneous. Well, it's not instantaneous. Yeah. Right, it's not. But it never makes it to the, vic the victim, right? I, I don't know that. That's not always true. It depends upon how the logic goes, because if you're running on a Bell module, I'm sorry, a reference monitor module, you're going to have your IPS going in series in the IP traffic. Right. And effectively, that says, I'm stopping everything, doing my analysis, and then I'll either allowing the traffic to continue or not. That's the fundamental Anderson model from 72 that I'm rejecting. Okay. Because it takes time. It interferes with the efficiency and the business process and everything all these guys want. Late, latency. Okay. Late, uh, latency is another thing I'm going to get into and I'll show you how that works. So people driving a car, same thing. Uh, if you're texting, why do we have texting accidents? Detection sucks. Reaction sucks more crashes and hopefully autonomous cars will be a result. And when you start thinking about any event, doesn't have to be security, just start thinking a little bit about protect, detect, react, and start adding a time component. Whenever you have a network discussion with anybody about any security issue, make sure that time is in the question and time is part of the answer, no matter what the answer is and your perception and view of the question and potential answer will radically change. <coughs> so this is about evaluating time, and there's some formulas in here. But fundamentally, it's going through exposure time, and there's some math, and I'll, if anybody wants it, I'll get it all to you. Ultimately, it comes down to, in the physical world, how much damage can I do in 90 seconds in a smash and grab? It's very limited. You know, it depends upon if the smash and grab is on Tiffany's on Fifth Avenue with $12 million. It's still limited, though. It is limited and can be specifically defined in the physical world based upon time and physical distance that we have an absolute knowledge of. And I'm going to show you how to do this in the cyber world. It can be done. We just chose not to. <laughs> Defense in depth is one of these things that has been a buzzword for a long time. Add more walls, add more protective stuff, yada, 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 yada. How's that working for us? Nah. It slows down the attackers, and I saw a great slide on Twitter earlier today. More security controls just means smarter bad guys. And I kind of like that, because when we do defense in depth, you're going to rob a house at the top of the hill. It's a big, rich house. What's the first thing you're going to do if you're a bad guy? And you're getting ready to break in and rob. Make sure they're not home. Make sure they're not home. That's make sure security's not there. Makes sure, and how do you do that? You cut the damn wires. Absolutely. So protection, defense in depth would say, in that particular case, under my detection system, the alarm, I'm going to add another layer of protection and detection and response, and I can do this as far as I want to go from a logical standpoint. Are you going to deter the guys in the physical world pretty well in the cyber world? You're going to move things around a little bit, shuffle them around a little bit. But when we're back to 90% of our attacks successfully occurring through social engineering, not so much. So which files then, which data inside of an environment becomes vulnerable? 
this is back to the smash and grab analogy. How much can you grab in what period of time? We're going to add another time element here, and it's bandwidth. What bandwidth are you dealing with? Do you have your web services sitting there at 100 gig? You very well might for all sorts of good reasons. Should you have the code formula sitting there on the same network with a 100 gig connection? Probably not. How big are the data files you are trying to protect? Are they used on a daily basis? Should they have the same bandwidth connection that everything else does? Is it a performance issue? Is it a security issue? And how do you achieve that balance? So one of the things that can be done, again, very simple analog function, is look at file size, look at bandwidth, look at time, because they're all components of each other. And then you can start looking at some potential defenses that the DOD has been using for 50 years. And there's padding mechanisms, there's obfuscation mechanisms, there's a lot of things that can be done to data. Uh, there's some new distributed data pointer kind of mini uh, XML stuff that's being used in Oracle systems that distributes it everywhere, adds the amount of time it takes to agglomerate the data in order to have it become meaningful data. But again, it's another view of how data size, bandwidth, file, and protection all tie together with the single domain of time. So, back to Electronics 101. This simple circuit up here, we're using Ohm's Law. The amount of current that is going through the lamp is the amount of applied voltage divided by resistance, in this case the potentiometer or rheostat. When I turn that knob up and down, what happens to the light bulb? Dimmer and brighter. Dimmer and brighter. And all I'm doing is reducing the amount of current that goes through that particular light bulb. What does this formula say? Time equals file divided by bandwidth. It's exactly the same thing. It's an identical function. The amount of data that can be breached from any particular environment is an analog function based upon time, file, size, and bandwidth. An identical parallel. So let's continue and see how this is going to help us. In a, I picked a one gig uh, circuit here down to, what did I have, down to one meg. Look at what happens if I use a technique, and this comes from the audio world, called compression. We do not currently have compression mechanisms built into our networks that will limit, in an analog function, the amount of data that can be exfiltrated based upon a detected IBS IPS event. And very simply, the data compression module that comes from any old analog circuitry, when something happens, if I go from one gig down to one meg, I now have a 99.9% .9 reduction in potential data breach and data extraction by merely putting in a bandwidth constrictor in those circuits where I tend to really, really care that that data is super, super important. Again, this is all policy driven and I'm not going to get into that. This is about adding a simple circuit into anywhere that you care about your data. Super, super simple to do. Next thing I cared about was root. <laughs> we all love root. Sign up, show of hands, come on. We all love root. Yeah, it's because you're all geeks and you want root control because you all want to be cyber Christ and gods, right? Get it. Yeah, <laughs> sir, yes, sir. Thank you. If you kill root, the tree will die. Yo! Um, with all due respect, sir, how many roots are there? One. Lots. Lots. Again, we're back to that technical term that the gentleman in the rear introduced. Exactly. So before we get into examining how to kill root, we have to go, does everybody know Boolean? Anybody not know Boolean? And show of hands, anybody who does not. Okay, these are the basic gates of truth tables. Everybody understands all that stuff. Cool. How many of you trust your spouse? <laughs> with your life? <laughs> totally with your life? <laughs> all right, so your kids are going to be beheaded unless your wife gives you up. <laughs> ISIS is going to behead your kids. If, unless, unless she gives you up, do you still trust your wife 100%? You're asking, would I sacrifice myself for my children? No, this is on your <laughs> wife. 
Would you would you would you would you would you would all right so therefore it's not a binary function <laughs> you don't trust her 100 percent because you we just found one condition where she would sacrifice you which is acceptable to you person. and i'm not saying that's a bad choice i'm just saying it's a reality that there is no such thing in our world as absolute perfect security. Okay. So this is a matter of do you trust? How much do we trust? And one of the things that we hear from HR, and I believe we started hit hitting on in the last two sessions a little bit, was the issue of trusted networks. <laughs> trusted employees. We all work with lots of folks. Just mentally, do you trust them all, let's say on a scale of zero to one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how much do you trust them? HR says the minute you hire them, they're trusted employees. Bullshit. No, that's what HR says. Don't give me bullshit. <laughs> that's what a background check. Sorry? They had a background check. They're good. They had a background check. And what does a background check say? Sir? Only, what, what, only They've never been caught before. Thank you. <laughs> You haven't been caught. And so like Germany and what's going on with all those the stuff and the crazies over there, a bunch of people haven't been caught yet. And what we do in many cases, and I don't know, some of you may have, if you have to have two signatures on a check, or you have two signatures, uh, two keys to get into the safety deposit box. Where we are right now is root control got one guy and he's got control over the whole network and I totally get that that's the way things are but that's not the way things should be and I think I have a way out of it so right now we're dealing with a binary trust factor from HR that says he's trusted what I'm suggesting is that we look at things based upon what is the real need of the person within that organization and what level of trust is needed. Uh, the help desk guy requires a different level of, level of trust than the guy who's doing the admin on the firewall server. Different levels of trust. Do we trust the C-level guy not to extort money? Do we trust the Enron people not to screw over the public? How much do we trust? What we don't use is weighting factors. And the reason I'm introducing weighting factors is when we go back into looking at the brain, the brain functions on an analog basis of called synaptic weighting. And what it does is it takes little bits of events, and in this case these are types of behavior and criteria, weighting them appropriately in order to come up with a probability of an event triggering a synapse or biochemical response in the brain. So, uh, and I'm using a value system of zero to one. So in case number one here, see, they really, really care about technical competence, and they don't care about belief systems, your psychological profile, career goals, all. In this case, all they really care about, past job history, technical competence, makes up the vast majority. That's the only thing that matters. So from a hiring standpoint, that to me would indicate, okay, I'm going to put him coding over there maybe, but I'm not going to give him the keys to the kingdom. Yes, sir. Um, did you invent these trust factors for our example here today, or is this in place in the real world? No, I, these are purely, I, I made up a bunch of stuff one night, okay. because every organization is going to have its own set of criteria, and the only requirement is that it's self-consistent. Yep. I, I mean, I think having this many is entirely too many. I put them there just to kind of give you some ideas. Because in some places, miscreant uh, illegal behavior. Okay, Th this guy, they don't give a crap at all. These guys over here, yeah, you did something wrong, and now I really care. And that becomes a significant weighting factor in their particular analysis of your trust. What ends up happening, and again, this is simple statistics, no biggies, I end up in case number one with a trust factor based upon their criteria, 0.779. In the other case over there, uh, we have a trust factor of 0.918, just based upon the same person using a different set of criteria. Entire point of this exercise, which will build into more of what we're going to do, 
is that the trust factor cannot be binary if we are hoping to really turn, be able to analyze risk and put something meaningful into our networks. So now, this is the real world. Um, or gates at root. There is not one person that has root control. You're going to have a buddy who's going to cover it from nine to, and typically the number is between four and seven. And that is just a mathematical requirement based upon hours and vacations and supervisors and all of that. So it comes down to redundancy. Sorry? It comes down, comes down to redundancy. It does create, but redundancy in this case creates risk. Yes. It's very, very different. So in this case, we got two guys, that's it. But in the real world, we got something that's certainly much more like this. Lots of guys, and they all have individual control over the root functionality of whatever the criteria. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter whether it's a thing. This could be code trusting. It could be a library talking to a hunk of code. It could be at any level from G to G all the way down. But here's what happens mathematically becomes a probabilistic issue. If I have two guys like him, and I trust him 0.9 for whatever reason, and I trust you 0.9, the math, I can't help the math, the trust factor of that root control is now reduced to 0.81. Simple probabilistic mathematics, no biggie. Now does this say there's a 10% chance of him either going bad or making an error? Probabilistically, it does, but that's how the weighting scale has to be determined independently for each particular environment. Now, here's something that's very interesting that comes out. Okay, I got him. I trust him to 0.9. I don't like you. I don't trust you. You're only worth 0.5. Suddenly, my trust factor is lower than the weakest link yep. in the chain. Take this and start multiplying it out. The answers get scary you're ending up with numbers that are 80 or 90 percent probabilistically to have an error or a miscreant event by somebody going bad. Didn't include all those slides here, but the numbers, it's simple prob probability. So how do we get around this? We introduce something called the two-man rule. Same thing we're doing with lockboxes. Me and my wife, we got to go to the thing, do the same thing at the same time, open it up, do our thing, and we leave, and we're good. Cool. So I want to put this into every network. How does that sound? Complicated. Slow? Oh, you're using, you're, you're thinking in time already. So, hierarchically, okay, we got this guy, and he's going to, actually, that's a woman, believe it or not, going to make a decision. And again, this could be an element of code. I just put people here because they're prettier. Makes a decision. That decision has to be verified by here. So we have Alice making the decision. Bob has to do the approval. We have the two-man rule. The problem, as he said, was time. Where is Bob? Is Bob right there? What was the business case for how fast this particular action had to take place? Is it a library call? Is it an administrative function? What is it that's going on? Again, it doesn't matter whether we're operating in 10 to the minus 9th or 10 to the 9th. It makes no difference. The formulas still work out exactly the same. But we have this time problem that is really, really awful. And we end up having Boolean AND gates. Boolean AND gates are really, really cool. All it says is that A and B inputs both have to be high at the same time to allow effect an effect to take place. Very, very simple conceptually with the exception of the time issue. So now we're going to put that away and bring in something entirely different. We're going to bring in dogfighting in from the U.S. Air Force. Anybody know what OODA is? All right, we got one OODA loop. What is it? Orient. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the... All right, observe, orient, decide, and act. Colonel John Boyd was a fighter pilot, and in the 1980s, he was teaching down at Maxwell University in Alabama, and came up with this concept because he realized that dogfighting was very ad hoc. It was seat of the pants kind of stuff with no formalization modeling at all. So he came up with the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. Now, in the marketing world, 
This is exactly what we do. I got a bright idea for a new product. I observe the world. And I make some, oh, I'm going to kind of do this. Then I'm going to orient myself, maybe with a little test marketing to see if the guy really likes it or not. Then I'm going to make a decision. We're going to go into production and we're going to make a lot of red furry things. Because that's what my study said. And the act, we're pushing it out there. And Walmart's got it and it's on every retail shelf. And I got a website and I got an ad on TV. Does it stop there? No. I now observe the success or failure in an analog form. Did I sell three of them? Or did I sell three million of them? How many did I sell? What do I need to change in order to optimize that? So I reobserve, I reorient. Now I realize they want blue and green furry things too, not only red furry things. So we've decided to make some more. Production is going to go in, we're going to load the shelves with it. It's a continual process that goes through analog life cycle curves, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It. This will overlay on that very nicely. This is all about time. How long does each one of these take? So what we started doing was looking at it called squeezing the loop. And again, this goes back to the issue of granularity I was speaking about earlier. The smaller we look at things, the more detail we get, the more digital view. As I pull back, I get more of an analog view. With an OODA functionality, whether I'm dogfighting, doing marketing, or as I'm going to show you how to do, apply some of this in networks, my entire goal is to make that OODA loop as fast as possible. So that iterative process never stops, and I want it to approach infinity. I want it to approach, I'm not going to put the calculus up here for you. <laughs> But it's a simple limit function, is really what it is. And all I'm doing is squeezing the loop. But in the real world, we don't just have four things. What we actually have is lots of little sub-things. And part of my orientation, I'm going to have, I'm going to orient on this stuff, and this stuff, and this stuff. And they're all going to have all of their own little OODA loops that are going to finally create a weighted output, an analog weighted output, that will allow me to go from observation to orientation. Same thing will occur with orientation. And this is an iterative process, regardless amount of the OODA in depth that I may be applying. Doesn't really matter. So in this case, I can actually get smaller household you want to get. If you're at the code level, you can go down to one cycle. You can go down to one clock cycle. How far deep do you want to get? How granular do you want to get? And every single one of these functions can be measured specifically in time. All right, now we're going to go into something entirely different, and then I'm going to start gluing all this crap together for you. Where's the speaker here? If I put this microphone in front of the speaker, what happens? Feedback. Feedback loop. What kind? Positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loops are called a bad thing. Everybody, we've been, we've all been to a concert, and it's yeah. like, God, that's awful. However, every successful engineering project in the history of mankind, with the exception of network security, <laughs> is based upon feedback. <laughs> so up here, we have the acoustic feedback system that I was just, who knows what this is over here? Um, that's part of the steam engine. No, it's a, it's a steam engine regulator. Governor, yeah. Governor regulator, yes. Yeah. It's, and it goes up and lets the pressure out so the train doesn't go too fast and all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, down here, this is an analog circuit. It's an amplifier. I have to have a negative feedback loop built into that process in order to control volume. And that's all a volume control is in the majority of analog circuits is adjusting the amount of feedback because if I just use an amplifier with zero feedback, I end up in a total runaway condition. The object of feedback in engineering systems and ICS systems is to limit, again, it's an analog concept, limit the extremities of the possible conditions that can exist within my particular environment. Learning. It's a feedback-based system. We have positive reinforcement, 
where you get a piece of candy, good boy, and all that. Or I went to a Catholic school, and my knuckles are still sore. <laughs> so there's different kinds of feedback, but it's part and parcel of absolutely everything we do. Uh, as we are, as I showed you earlier, we're doing the digital human interfaces in order to enhance people's lives. That's all going to be based upon feedback systems using synaptic weighted learning, a combination of digital and analog technologies. I was just in Holland working with the G20, and I got this lesson. I was giving this talk, and they said, well, why don't you use Holland as an example? And I got my lesson on water control systems from the North Sea. And essentially, it's a bunch of sensors, various le water levels. How do you control the dikes? How much water is in? How much water can go out in order to avoid what they run into? They run into Hurricane Sandy level stuff all the time. And in the 1950s, you may recall, uh, well, the guy with the gray hair and I remember, uh, Holland flooded. It was an absolute disaster. And they said, we got to fix this. And they built a dike system that is the epitome of an ICS-based feedback system that has limited conditions. Water can only go so low, only can go so high. So what happens if we took this same approach and applied it to a, any network security process at all? And in this particular case, all I'm saying is, okay, well, a process request, I don't care what it is. Before, I'm gonna let that process approval occur instantaneously. Unlike in the traditional Anderson and Bell Apodular model, which has a delay or we have a IDS, IPS in series in our, in our traffic, I'm going to allow that to occur. But at the same time, I'm going to begin a clock. I'm going to start a clock. And that clock is a decrementing clock. And it's going to have some time value associated with it. One second, one millisecond, one hour, doesn't matter. If my secondary or tertiary or quaternary doesn't matter, level of approval, sanction of that first condition, does not occur within the amount of a lot of time, there's an immediate revocation of that particular event's approval. Everybody got this? All I'm doing is a decrementing clock. And, and here's another example of it. Metal man's gonna make something happen, but if this guy does not approve it, because he's notified, if he doesn't approve it, to stop the clock, revocation. What does this mean? This means I now can delineate very specifically my maximum amount of time exposure, whether it's code level or G to G level, doesn't matter, the maximum amount of exposure that I decide that my policy and risk tolerance will allow based upon whatever criteria you have for your organization doesn't matter what it is. It's a very, very abstracted model. So we can use this for logons. We can use it for authentication. Now, in some cases, we're actually doing this today. Uh, I'm with Bank of America, and when I log on, I have it set that if I'm logging on from someplace funky or a different machine, it, it, it gives me so many minutes for a good password to enter in my, um, uh, my, my correct authentication. The original uh, RSA tokens from Secure ID up in Massachusetts in the early 90s, those were time-based tokens. And it was a synchronization where you had two synced up algorithms working like this, and valid password on your display was good for either 30 seconds or 60 seconds, as I recall, and then it would change over. So it was a similar process, except that was done with synchronization instead of feedback, but the same type of principle of uh, work. When you walk into an office and you open the door and your office has a full-blown security system and you're the first guy there in the morning, what's the first thing you have to do? Open the door. Okay, what is the second thing we're going to do? Turn the alarm. Disarm the alarm. How long do you have? Some amount of pre-programmed amount of time for you to get to the alarm, disarm it, validate it with some secondary authentication code, because your key was number one, enter the code number two, that's a decrementing clock function in the physical world that we currently use before the cops are called, or whoever your security service is. All I'm saying is, this is a nice analog 
It's an analog analog is what it is from the physical world into the cyber world that we have not really played with. So how would this look in a reference monitor Anderson type of model? We have a system request. So do we pause process? We can pause the process based upon time or not based upon time. We can do the lookup ACTs, the deny permit, and go no-go and process, but everything is unilaterally hinged upon the amount of time that policy allows that particular condition to create your exposure. And then the exposure is an analog function, again, based upon file size, bandwidth, and time. Time being the consistent metric throughout everything that we're using here. Now, anybody know what this is up here? Whoa, good, who said that? You guys are gonna get all the goodies for that. Are you an, are you an old EE? You're a young EE. No. You're a digital guy that I'm going to quit harassing because you're not helping me. <laughs> that is a flip-flop. And what a flip-flop works, and here's the truth table for it, very, very simple. We'll call this admin A. And, oh, sorry, admin A. You're going to set a condition. You set the condition. Q goes high. Reset condition. Q goes low. Q prime is the inverse of it. This is also called a bit of memory. This is how memory is achieved in SRAMs and all of the stuff that we've been using and all the new SSDs. This is fundamentally the same hunk of logic. Turn my output either high or low. And in a memory usage, fundamentally you get rid of the Q prime and you're only caring about the Q level output. Now, what happens if I add analog time feedback to this? I have a set condition. So we're not going to use the Q prime output, don't need it for this. But set is going to enable Q. Q will remain high. It's going to start my decrementing clock. But if B does not approve to stop and stops that clock's decremation, what happens to Q? Q goes low. This is putting analog feedback into an RS flip-flop logic that can be decided exclusively by policy, and it takes six lines of code to do this. That's all it takes. And I don't have a good name for this. I have called it a T and gate for time. I don't have a good one for it yet, but before I publish that better. And here is the truth tables for it. All of the truth tables, and you'll notice that many of them are analog functions because we're not dealing explicitly with on off. Yes, Q is either on or off, because the next bit down the line I need to communicate with in a binary way. But the decision-making process, I'm turning into that hybrid analog function. And the truth tables, and if anybody could find errors with them before I publish, thank you, thank you very much, I'd love to see that. How do you launch a nuke? Very carefully. <laughs> Is that the guy with the white glasses that said that? Yeah, smart ass. How do you launch a nuke? You don't pay your taxes. Don't pay your taxes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Putin. He's back here said two keys. Two keys? Two keys? Two keys farther apart. Farther apart, and they have to do what? Simultaneous. Simultaneous. You just used a word that we agreed earlier does not exist in the physical world outside of quantum entanglement. Also, you have to have the launch codes. That's way before that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, are, you already got the laundry. But the okay. passwords, they're easy to get, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Big red button. That is the circuit on how to launch it. What it is, uh, launching a nuke, or it, it, this can be applied, obviously, in network security very easily. You're creating a time window, whether it's Ad Alice is first or Bob is first, and how much time Bob has to approve Alice or Alice has to approve Bob. You can sequence and design your flip-flops in such a way with the feedback loops in order to determine who has priority, who doesn't have priority, assuming that you have some sort of hierarchy. You might tie that to trust value, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. But ultimately, there is the simple math for it down there, and it's an analog function. It's a min-max condition. And the more and more I look at network security from a min-max condition, the less I see zeros and ones, the more I see the real world of if comes and 
how do we code this? How do we put this into honest to God real practice? And this ends up being some of the formulas, which are, again, very, very simple. I'm not going to go through them. But they're all analog. They're all analog functions. And ultimately, at the very end, is how you establish whether you're Q or Q prime and what state it's going to be in. Now we're going to add something else, because all this is great and dandy. But how do you really apply this into our existing IPv4 and IPv6 worlds? We're going to do an IPv7. Do you think I'm inventing that? <laughs> I hope to hell I'm not, because it'll never happen. How much, what do we have, IPv6, 20% adaption or something? Yeah, right. Something like that. Whatever we do, whether it's at the code level, G to G level, I don't care what level it's at, we have to maintain the existing infrastructure. Cannot change it, because that would be an absolute abject failure. So I'm going to go back to my old audio days. And in the 1970s, we decided we're going to computerize audio so computers can do the mixing, and we don't have to remember which note the guitar made. Well, we've got to pull it down, the voice go up. So the computer, we could do it once, and the computer would remember it. It was a disaster, thorough disaster. But a guy named Paul Buff from Nashville invented this thing called the VCA, Voltage Controlled Amplifier. And here's the key to it. TCP IP is the greatest thing in the world. It's also the worst thing in the world. Because on one single wire with one set of protocols, I have both data transmission and control signals. And that's a great thing, and it's a shitty thing. It's both. Again, we're living with some duality already. I'm just trying to solve a little bit of it. So, what Paul did is said, we're now going to have an external voltage source to drive and determine the amplification factor of that particular audio signal. And then we'll tie that to a computer. The VCA component worked. The computers were epic fail. I mean, we're looking at mid-70s here. Nothing ever worked. But what we did is we went out of band. We went out of band for our control signal because in those days, consoles, they failed. Things broke. And you wanted to be able to move your signal flow around very, very quickly. In our case today, we're having a bitch of a time doing that because the control signal and the data signal are going down the same damn wire. What the VCA solved was, if there was a control problem inside of our audio network, the signal would still flow at the last memorable, uh, at the last volume, last voltage setting that the VCA heard. This also parallels, which I'll talk about in a moment, is what HP is putting out there now, which is some really, really cool technology. So this is our, this is what we got inside TCP IP right now. And that's all great and dandy, and I don't want to touch any of that, because I don't understand most of it. I really don't. You guys are much better at this than I am. But when we look at the real world, of flat network controls, because largely we are still in a flat network world, because we do not have MLS employed, no matter how many, what we've been working on, 35 years, we've been trying to do multi-level security and failing absolutely at it. So we have flat networks everywhere. What we do not have is what I call detection in depth. We like to say we have an intrusion detection system. We like to say we have an intrusion prevention system that is detecting something. We like to say we have antivirus that's detecting bad malware. How many detection points do we have in a typical network though? Who said three? Three. I, I don't know the answer. I mean, is it three? Is it 300? Three question mark. Three question mark. In a network of 100,000 machines, how many detection points should we have? I would argue eight. I'd say a shitload more than 100,000. Because in each one of those environments, each one of those boxes, you have an awful lot of other stuff going on as well that relates back to the TCP IP stack. Depends upon what you care about. So the concept of detection in depth requires that I have more than zero, less than infinity, and I'm back to my detection and reaction time will sit somewhere within those limits. 
Everybody with me on this? Okay, now it's going to get a little bit more complex. This is a functional detection reaction matrix module. And it's fairly simple conceptually. I'm going to monitor an asset. That could be the validity of a packet. It could be the trustworthiness of uh, a library output of a call. It could be a human being. It could be connecting to a business partner. Doesn't matter. Then we're into detection. We're into the time clock that begins it. Decisions are based upon a reaction matrix, which are policy driven. And those that should be designed for business process and security. Then we create a reaction. And the reaction will ultimately be enforced back up into the path of the TCP IP uh, uh, of the data transfer. This is the fundamental module that would be sitting at any place you want to have detection, whether again it's interlibrary or all the way up at the, at, at the networking level. What this ends up looking like, I'm not even going to, oh, the reaction matrix, just make some decisions, figure out what the hell you're going to do. How many of you have ever had a security incident and the gut reaction by your in-house counsel is to call the FBI? Yeah. That's because they don't have internal policies, reactions, escalations, certs, all of the basic stuff that you have to have can be formalized back into this reaction matrix with the reaction matrix and the reaction decisions that are occurring based upon policy. And ultimately, we can have a single reaction. Uh, matrix. And so I'm monitoring these servers here, monitoring my perimeter stuff here, and I'm making some decisions down here as to what to do. It's all out of band. If my entire decision matrix goes away and dies, my worst case is I'm back to where I am now. That's my downside. I don't want to take anything away from what we're doing. I want to add detection in depth so it will actually accomplish something. Now in this case, we've got perimeter detection going on hits the reaction matrix, but in this case I'm not detecting here. I'm telling these guys, well, my reaction, because I'm getting beat the shit out of me on the perimeter, is to up the sensitivity of my internal detection mechanisms. By how much? Back to policy and how the detection matrix is actually configured. Anybody know what this is? Wow, good! This is a GE jet engine that's from 777s and 87s. Inside of this engine, there are 5,000 detection points that are updated every second. One terabyte of data per hour comes out of a jet engine. Yeah, damn. The two leading companies in it are GE and Siemens. I mean, some amazing, well, Rolls Royce does the British engine. But Siemens and GE are doing amazing stuff with sophisticated detection networks. The detection network is what makes ICS and SCADA work. The lack of them in our world is why we are failing. So when we look at detection in depth, it becomes a level of granularity. We talked about that earlier. Is it going to be, how often are you going to do it? Are you going to do it on every clock cycle? Theoretical Shannon limit? Sure, you could do that if you choose. That'd be stupid. But that would give you the only way to do perfect security is if you approach the Shannon limit for a detection mechanism. Thinking by time and bandwidth versus policy, value of IP, data breaches, what are you trying to protect? And that's always one of the really, really hard questions. So where are we going to place it? <coughs> because we're dealing with an abstract analog concept here, it can be used absolutely anywhere within our network environment. So, what is a reaction matrix protocol going to look like? I don't know. I stole this picture. So I don't know. But I know I'm going to want some things. I'm going to want to know from where to where. I'm going to want some timestamps. I'm going to need some lookup tables. I'm going to have to have some communication protocols. I know the kind of, but that's what protocol experts do for a living, and the IEEE will figure out how to make this out-of-band reaction matrix have its own detection reaction matrix protocol to be able to talk to standard IP traffic, whether it's V4 or V6 should make no difference at all. So let's take a look at denial of service. Right now, denial of service is, shit, I'm getting the hell beat out of me. Can you do something about it? What are you seeing down at your end? 
And he's going to go, well, I'm going to go take a look. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm seeing, well, no, no, not that one. No, this one. Oh, shit, I see that one. Oh, I got to call Alice. If every single ISP from tier one to tier five had a detection reaction matrix that automatically said, I'm getting the crap beat out of me. I'm going to communicate out of band because my primary DOS channels may be being DOS at the moment using an external detection reaction protocol down to the next hop. I can then automatically in that protocol say, I'm seeing this shitty traffic. Please stop it. And what happens to tier two guy? He can then now talk to his peering partners all simultaneously, well, close to simultaneously, sorry about that, in close to real time, communicate the nature of the bad traffic and what ends up happening. Suddenly, I have a way to not only stop DOS, I have a way to track the source of it. All automatically, out of band communications using existing IP technology with the mere addition of these kind of modules with out of band communications on the back end. So we take this kind of concept, all time based, every bit of this time based, and essentially up here, those are just assets. That's my normal TCP IP channel that we were talking about earlier. And if you want to have IDS and IPS stuff sitting in there, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to tell you not to do that at all. But what I am saying is having detection in depth at as many points as makes sense. And I don't know what that answer is today. And it's going to vary from product to product, installation to installation. But ultimately, there's going to be a super management console in order to drive policy across all of the various internal domains and levels that I'm going to want to play with. Now we're going to add one more thing, and then I'm going to get the hell out of here. I'm going to add negative time. Now this again came back from my audio days. Anybody remember Whole Lot of Love by Led Zeppelin? Yeah. 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 All right. I was the recording engineer on it with Eddie Kramer. Yeah. And the delay of the audio. Remember, whoa, 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 whoa. You hear all the delays of the voices, right? What we did is we had our big 16-track machine with all the stuff on it. In order to do that, we'd have some old mono or two-track machines. We'd put one over where he is, another one where he is, and string tape between them and put the signal into this and read it off of this, and the way we would adjust the amount of delay was by moving the tape machines to, what the hell are you laughing at, dude? This is how we work. This is how I roll. Yeah, it's analog, dude. Now, what happens if I'm in a particular environment where it's super, super, super high speed performance is required. Super, super, super high security is required. Now, let's take what we've just thought about. If I have good detection and good reaction on whatever point in the circuit I'm dealing with, and let's say that that detection reaction result, which is my exposure time, I'm gonna nominally set to one millisecond. I'm making it up because you know, shit's gotta move fast, right? How do I achieve perfect security, measurably? Anybody? Slow it down. Slow it down. <clears throat> By one clock cycle greater than the detection and reaction time circuitry by using, this is the old digital delay line circuits we used to use back in the 70s. By delaying, and then I end up with an optimization with a limit function, and I've got mathematically provable security for that particular chain. They do the same thing in broadcasting with like the five minute delay so that they don't violate FCC rules, right? Well, what, what do you have against Janet Jackson's breasts? <laughs> Very little. Uh, I'd like to have more, but. Uh... The entire goal with this whole approach is for detection. The limit function is zero. For reaction, the limit function is zero. But those are not real. My maximum, my minimum amount of detection and reaction possible is the Shannon limit, of course, which is unrealistic. But ultimately, we're talking about a time difference. And if I can quantify with a high level of assurance that my detection and reaction system 
is measurably accurate for whatever that time domain is, and I introduce into the traditional data traffic a delay signal, I have mathematically critical security. Time-based reference monitor does effectively this, can be introduced at any point, anywhere in any circuits, it really doesn't matter. And we have some code that we'll be publishing sometime in the next several months on how to get all of this done. There is some of the numbers, because we do are dealing with indeterminates in some cases, but it, think of min and max conditions. Think of squeezing that OODA loop for optimizing the performance by looking at it as a feedback controlled system in order to be able to gain some handle on what our risk is. <laughs> right now, what we're doing is a binary function not working. I'm not saying I got the answer to everything. I'm saying I've got an approach. Uh, I did 300 guys from NASA. I've done this for 10,000 people around the world. They've helped me modify it and grow it and fix some of the math that I had all screwed up. That's why I want your input on this. But it looks like that we do have the potential to be able to actually build in some areas that make sense mathematically provable security, which oddly enough, and I did not know this until a few months ago, while I was doing some research, the same formulas appear when we're doing queuing functions for load, load balancing. And I didn't know it. They're exactly the same formulas, and I kind of came up with them on my own. And it was like, oh, shit, that's kind of cool. So possible application. The only one I'm going to give you right here is fishing. And fundamentally, users click on stupid shit. <laughs> How long does it take your phishing detection engine to make a decision? If your vendor can't measure it, we need to force the vending community to start telling us what's going on under the hood with some sort of level of matrix. So you're looking up the link, the sandbox, you're doing a decision matrix based upon D plus R, go, no go, and ultimately instead of doing it in line from a delay standpoint, we can trigger a delay by using the time, uh, not the time compression, by using the negative time influence that would equal or be greater to the amount of time it takes for your fishing engine to actually do its job. And will the user see a 50 millisecond delay? Yes. No. Screw the user, I hope the hell they do. <laughs> so I, I don't understand the value of the delay versus the unlock. I mean, I mean, I'm probably missing I'm sorry? I don't understand the, the value of the delay versus being in line. Uh, because I want to keep as many things out of inline as possible because I don't want to screw around with existing infrastructure as much as possible. And when uh, Bill Cheswick and I got together a few years ago and we started doing some modeling, we both agreed that we don't know what our environment's going to be. And I wanted as much of this to be as out of band as humanly possible. So the elements that I'm introducing in line are, are time compression, I'm sorry, uh, is a negative time element, which is the delay line. And I've got bandwidth compression. And those are fundamentally appliances that sit in line that would be part of the reaction matrix. However, if the outer band circuits and all of those die on me in a good design condition, I would then go back to the default of tops level speed, and that'd be my existing condition that I have today. But that was the rationale behind it. I don't want to put any more stuff into our existing loads than we currently have to. So, uh, what can it do? I don't know. I've been thinking about this a while. I don't want to come up with all the applications. I'm going to be running some workshops, uh, getting into some of this a lot more detail uh, when I have a chance to figure out or let you guys figure out where else could this kind of thing work? Where else would it be applicable? How can we get some of the vendors to start really uh, playing with these things? One of the things that really bothers me is IoT. Uh, we're building IoT under Zigbee now and it's like, oh my god, are you serious? and we're going to have 28 billion of these things out there, and we're screwed, because there is absolutely nothing in it that's fundamentally other than a binary condition decision that has, that's hackable. And I'm, we're going to make another terrible, huge mistake. These are the tenants that I use when I think about network security now, whether it's, a, a, I got calls from HP on well, printer security. Well, let me think about it from an analog standpoint. And I'm watching TV with my wife, and I go, oh, you know, that was, an, that was a digital decision. It really should have been an analog one, and she's just giving me the eyes of course. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm viewing my world 
that I live in, the physical world, and the network world that I have my career in, completely differently than I ever did before. And I'm finding it really, really valuable. My clients are find, finding that some of the insights and approaches and outputs that you get with not having pure binary decision making uh, are creating uh, some nice answers. Please buy my book. And that is the end of my pitch in an hour and a half. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>